Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem called Who Learns My Lesson Complete. Uh, this is taking us now back to Walt Whitman as pedagogue or teacher. Uh, this is poem number 28 of the 38 of Autumn Rivulets. Um, a number of these small poems at the end of Autumn Rivulets, by the way, have to do with education. And I think there's a good reason for that. Autumn, of course, of or related to the old, rivulets of or related to the new. That is to say, education has always been this process of going from the old to the new, the new then becoming the old again, and the, and, and the like. Uh, the key uh, word of this poem will be wonderful, and we'll comment on its repetition. Now, the assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, down that left inside Talks with Waldar playlist, and that you've been with us from the very beginning, those opening comments when we talked about the five Whitmans of one of those being the pedagogue or the instructor or the teacher. I think it's hypercritical to remember that Whitman started out as a teacher. He then left that profession to go into journalism and ultimately to become the poet that we love today. But we, I think he always was at his heart, uh, the, the instructor. And it's always been about learning and, and, and um, hopefully you've been uh, paying attention to these lectures it, from that perspective. Of course, Song of Myself 4647 comes to mind, the idea of destroying the teacher and all of that. Um, we did give a set of introductory comments on Autumn Rivulets, I hope you're familiar with. And, uh, and then we just finished with other may, Others May Praise. Our, um, our Nortons uh, will, will tell us uh, about, about this poem, <clears throat> that it's the 11th of the 12th untitled poems of uh, Leaves of Grass, 1855. So this was first published in 1855 with, with uh, the other texts, like Song of Myself, although not called, not called that, right? In 56, it was titled Lesson Poem, and in Leaves of Grass, 1860, 1867, Leaves of Grass, number 11 and number 3, respectively, in Passage to India of 1871, under the present title, and so in Leaves of Grass, 1881. Considerably revised, the poem was most interestingly altered in line 21, which in the first three editions read this way, quote, And how I was not palpable once, but am now, and was born on the last day of May in the year of 43 of America, and was passed from a babe in the creeping trance of three summers and three winters to articulate and walk, all this is equally wonderful, and that I grew six feet high, and that I have become a man 36 years old in the year 79 of America, and that I am here anyhow, are all equally wonderful. Well, let's turn now to the poem itself, and we'll, uh, we'll work as we go because it's a little bit longer poem. We'll, of course, start with the word learns, um, and this takes us back to Song of Myself 47. Uh, that is to say, he most honors my style who learns under it to destroy the teacher. By the way, uh, that's the only other use of this word learns in all of Lisa Grass, so I find that fascinating. We begin, by the way, with the opening line and the word complete. Who learns my lesson complete? That is to say, understanding all the way through. As we talk about it, of course, the three levels of reading. You're not just reading if you're reading at level one summary or even at level two when we're talking about thematically or rhetorically. You've got to learn to read at that third level. In other words, relate it to other, to other texts and to yourself, most importantly. Notice now we're going to begin to get Whitman's inclusivity in regards to his pedagogy, his approach to education. Boss, journeyman, apprentice, churchman, and atheist. By the way, the word atheist only gets used as, as an adapted word, not as atheist. Um, one other time uh, in Song of Myself 43. Notice that he'll join things together that are obviously opposites, and that's interesting to us, churchman and atheist. The stupid and the wise thinker, parents and offspring, merchant, clerk, porter, and customer. Notice the high as well as the low. Editor, author, artist, and schoolboy. And then notice the dash. Draw nigh, you'll remember this phraseology from Song of Joys. Draw nigh and commence. It is no lesson. It lets down the bars to a good lesson, and that to another, and everyone to another still. In other words... Uh, lifelong learning, or to quote Tennyson's Ulysses, uh, I am part of all that I have met, yet all experiences and arc went through gleams that unraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. Later to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought. I think that Whitman was very influenced by Tennyson, especially Tennyson's view of learning and education. Then we have a break, and then we're going to get to 14 of these I, uh, the use of the pronoun I. The great laws, and we've heard about that already in Autumn Rivulets, take and effuse without argument. The use of the word effuse takes us to rivulets, obviously. I am of the same style, 
for I am their friend, a friend to the great laws. In other words, to the things that really matter. I love them quits and quits, which I think just means through and through. I do not halt and make salams. Now, it's fascinating that he would use this phraseology, especially in 1855, and it's the only time that it ever gets used. So here he is writing in a, in a poem for American readers who are predominantly Christian using salam. I find that remarkable. I lie, he says, abstracted, and hear beautiful tales of things and the reasons of things. They're so beautiful, later it'll be wonderful. I nudge myself to listen. I love the word nudge used here. It's the only time in all these grass the word gets used. And if you'll think about it, in some ways this is what Talks with Walt has always been about, nudging us to say, hey, you might want to pay attention. I cannot say, the idea of it being translinguistic, I cannot say to any person what I hear, I cannot say it to myself, it is very wonderful. 24 times in Leaves of Grass the word wonderful gets used. 11 of those 24 times is right here in this poem. In other words, if he's going to talk at all about what's most important that's to be handed on from teacher to student, it is this sense of wonder, this sense of awe, this sense of reverence. It's no small matter, this round and delicious globe. We've obviously heard his talking about globe before in Leaves of Grass. Moving so exactly in its orbit forever and ever without one jolt, without one jolt or the untruth of a single second. The fact that we hang in space is miraculous. I do not think... Now this is going to be interesting. And obviously we're going to have some serious challenges to a set of lines like this when it was published for the first time in 55 and obviously in the, in the deathbed edition. I do not think the, the, the earth, the globe, I do not think it was made in six days, nor in 10,000 years, nor 10 billions of years. Whoa! So in other words, he says, I don't buy either the very limited uh, notion of the, of the biblical, uh, literal interpretation of the biblical text of six-day creation, nor, he says, do I buy the Darwinian evolutionary model of tens of billions of years. Wow! He's an iconoclast through and through. He says, nor do I think it was planned and built one thing after another as an architect plans and builds a house. In other words, he argues, I don't believe that there's this notion of some creator that constructed all of this, a single architect. Well, obviously, this kind of language is really going to be iconoclastic in Whitman's own time. He says, just to continue his attack on certain biblical ideas, I do not think 70 years is the time of a man or a woman, obviously commenting on the Psalm 90.10 passage, that limits most people's lives to 70 years. Doesn't limit it, but suggests that's kind of the frame in which people will, are to live. Nor that 70 millions of years is the time of a man or a woman, nor that years will ever stop the existence of me or anyone else. Uh, this, this idea, of course, uh, of it, it, it is best represented probably in Song of Myself, Passage 6, at the very concluding lines. Uh, in other words, if we are energy, energy is that which can be neither created nor destroyed, and to that degree we can't die. We're, we're beyond death we, uh, because we're energy. And then he comes back to it, and, and he does it in an interesting kind of rhetorical question. Is it wonderful that I should be immortal, as everyone is immortal? In other words, we're all this way because we're all energy, right? I know it is wonderful. But my eyesight is equally wonderful. You'll remember this from passage of 48, to show a bean in its pod confounds, to glance with an eye or show a bean in its pod confounds the learn, learning of all time. I think we're coming back to that line here. And how I was conceived in my mother's womb is equally wonderful, taking us again to Psalm 139, 14. Now, we today, readers today don't often go there. I guarantee you Whitman's readers for sure went to these two passages in Psalms because they knew the Psalms well. And notice here that in a book called Leaves of Grass, where he's constantly talking about singing and chanting, he references the Psalms here two times. But notice how he does it in a very iconoclastic way, no question about it. He says, and he says as well, it's amazing or wonderful how I pass from a babe in the creeping trance, you'll remember creeping from out of the cradle endlessly rocking, of a couple of summers and winters to articulate and walk. All this is equally wonderful, and it of course is, it's, it's amazing. There you, there you have the newborn child, and within a matter of what will seem like hours to parents, it'll only be a matter of a few months, and all of a sudden the baby is beginning to figure out how to speak and articulate, and by the age of two, three, the child can carry on discourse. It's, it's truly remarkable. Notice all these ands now. He's got several of them. In other words, and this is wonderful, and this is wonderful, and that my soul embraces you this hour. Now, the poem will finish remarkably, although... 
not surprisingly, giving our study of Brooklyn Ferry and elsewhere, where he has this tendency to just kind of reach out and to, and, to, and to grab us as readers and to bring us into the poem. Notice he'll call it embracing. We talked about hugging. We talked about all the other words that would have some, you know, clutching, all of that, wrestling, all of those ideas. And then my soul embraces you this hour, and we affect each other. Uh, this is one of the lines that led me to call our series Talks with Walt. In other words, Whitman says, in the process of me embracing you, you are embracing me, and therefore both of us are affected in some profound way without ever seeing each other, which is even more remarkable. And never, I love perhaps, to see each other is every bit as wonderful. In other words, Whitman says to a group of students who will be reading this poem many years later, way after a hundred years later, we can embrace. I find that truly remarkable. The best dialogue is obviously an embracing. I could argue that the best teaching is also a form of embracing, isn't it? It's a form of exchange, and that's beautiful. That's wonderful is what he calls it. And that I can think such thoughts as these is just as wonderful. And that I can remind you, that word remind, in my estimation, is the goal of Leaves of Grass. Whitman wrote Leaves of Grass to remind us of a profound uh, idea Again, it's his theodicy. When bad things happen, don't ask why did it happen to me, but rather for me. That idea of reminding what matters, what's of importance, the cosmos, if you will. And you think them and know them to be true is just as wonderful. In other words, notice in our study of Talks with Walt, there have been moments in our study of Leaves of Grass where we have stumbled onto ideas and we have said, there is something profound about what it is that he is saying. Remember what he said about wisdom, for example, in Song of the Open Road 6? It can't be tested in schools. It's got to be somehow experienced out in the larger world. Finally, he finishes, and that the moon spins around the earth and on with that and, and on with the earth is equally wonderful. And that they balance themselves with the sun and stars is equally wonderful. Twelve times in Leaves of Grass, the word balance gets used. This is the key word for me of this poem. And as well, you'll remember it in Me and Perturb, oh, to be self-balanced for contingencies. And I think in the end, that's the point that he's saying. All great learning leads us to become more balanced. And yet, at the same time, as Vadgasi pointed out, the great cognitive psychologist, the great Russian theorist, along with Piaget, there's something profoundly beautiful, wonderful, about being a little imbalanced, not too much, but just a little bit, to be challenged, if you will, in some way. Well, what are we going to do with a poem like this at 2A? Well, I think his argument is that life is learning and therefore wonderful. At 2B, I love the repetition of the use of the word wonderful. It brings a certain kind of energy to this poem that's, that's really remarkable. At 3A, I, I like to gesture towards the Rose Walden. You'll remember I went, to the, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. That idea of deliberateness obviously will play right into uh, the idea here. And then, of course, his referencing the Psalms in the two uh, references. Of course, this poem will end up in Autumn Rivulets because we're talking about the teacher and the student, the old and the new, and the way in which one flows into the other. Finally, as 3B, in a way you can own this, this kind of a poem. I mean, if you're this far into Leaves of Grass with me, and you've been studying all of these poems, one of the obvious questions is, what is it that you're learning? And to what degree do you love to learn? And, I think important, is our study of Leaves of Grass helping you to find that, can we say wonderful? Love. I hope so. Thank you.